Hello and welcome to episode two of our Infinite Backlog podcast. I am Ricardo, and my partner in crime as always... I'm Todd. Hello. Hi. Uh, on this episode, we are going to be talking about uh, Banjo-Tooie, the sequel to Banjo-Kazooie. The follow-up from our last podcast. Yes. Um, now, for Todd here, he does not necessarily like this game as much as I do. I, I love it. I don't know what you're on about. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have very fond memories of this game as opposed to the first one. I played a ton of the second game. And you, Todd? Uh, for me, Bandit Kazooie is what I grew up with. That was my childhood game. Tui, I only had the uh, pleasure of coming across about four years ago, five years ago, when um, a viewer of mine loved me so much that he decided to send me the game for free, which is amazing, so I always appreciate yeah. that. However, I always feel a bit guilty because I've never enjoyed it. And that was not me, to be clear. No, no. I did not send him the game. <laughs> I would, but I didn't. No, and think yourself lucky you didn't. <laughs> yes, uh... Well, let's start off with you, because I've got a lot to talk about when it comes to this game. Um, let's start out with positives. Uh, what did you like? Positives, positives. Fuck, man, that's, uh, that's right at the bottom of the barrel for compared to the rest of it. <laughs> um, personally, I think I actually did quite enjoy it. They tried to make the game bigger. You know, they did try to make the experience better. They tried sort of amping it up, giving you more to do. Um, but that's really about it. I can kind of appreciate what they tried, but for me it just all fell quite flat. I definitely see where you're coming from. Like with the that. whole experience, you know? Yeah. Um, the beginning of the like, that game, the beginning is so long to get into. Um, it establishes what happens in the first game, and just starting out, like, I just wanted to play the game just like just starting the game and it was just so long and by the end of it i was kind of questioning should i continue or should i stop right here (laughs) and play it later because that 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 beginning was so long um but one positive i can say is that uh it has you have all the moves from the first game like added on top of the moves that you will get throughout the game as well i thought that was really cool which is quite impressive considering the limitations of the controller Limitations of the control, yeah, that thing but was a mess. Saying that though, a lot of the moves are just the same as the first game. Like, you get different kinds of eggs, well, you still shoot them the same. You get another yeah. kind of, you know, slam, well, you still do it the same, you just hold the Z button. You know, it's like, it's really not anything new for most of those moves, pretty much all of it, other than the Doom style mini game of going through, like, the occasional dungeon FPS mode. Um, I hated those. Yeah, they're a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, yeah. You know, there, there isn't actually anything new that there wasn't before. You know, the newest thing they have in terms of mechanic is the whole separating from each other thing, which I find quite boring and pointless. Like, you're basically having their abilities to do pointless shit. Well, it's kind of funny. When they split up, uh, later on in the game, Kazooie is the character to always use. Yeah, because... Banjo becomes essentially useless except for some certain points where you have to press a button with only Banjo and Kazooie, you know? Yeah, like, Banjo becomes the button man and Kazooie needs to go wherever you need to go because she's quicker and can fly, essentially. Yeah, she can... Well, she's got glide. a longer glide yeah. that you get eventually. Exactly. Which is, all, you know, really cool. Um, but... Uh, back onto like the game feeling flat. Yeah. Um, like the game never felt like it had an immediate threat. No. Like the game shows you, oh, there's the Bob that can drain life from, from like, anything, and it's, as the player, you're like, oh, is this gonna come into play? Bob shows up for one minute, and then you never see it again until the very end of the game where you shut it down. Spoilers here. <laughs> well, what else are you going to get when you're watching a podcast other than the spoilers, eh? This is true. But that still like brings home the point that there was really not a threat to go through each of these worlds, even though I found them personally like entertaining to a certain extent. Yeah, nothing really like, uh, felt... I don't know, yeah, nothing really felt like it was 
that drastic. Like the worlds, like for me, the worlds felt like they were self-contained. Although they were open to the other worlds, they didn't feel tampered with. Them, if you know what I mean. Whereas what I found in like Banjo Kazooie is like when there was a problem in the world, it's because of Gruntilda. It was caused yes. by her. Like you know, like Rus like that's what like they you know they they do blame. I think a couple times they blame the witch and things like that. So I know with Clanker, he definitely blames uh, the witch. Yeah, I'm not too sure about any other instance of that. I think though. the oil spill in Rusty Bucket Bay might have been pointed towards that. Maybe. Um, um, you do get a little bit of that, like with Grutun uh, Gruntilda's factory. I forget the exact name. Uh, Witchy World is directly influenced by her. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember any any other. I think maybe. Uh, Litter Gulch Mine, maybe also affected by her. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. But I never felt like uh, the characters were really in peril. No, no. The, like you get the King Jinjo who's in peril, and that's about it. No other character. Oh well, that bottles. Yeah. Uh, no other character really shows any kind of immediate uh, danger no. to either themselves or the world around them. No, or they don't feel as interactive. Like you got the polar bears back, or seeing when you're in which world, and you got to get them back to their mother and things like that. But I think I think every world pretty much has characters to help in Banjo Kazooie, and like yeah, there's the odd thing in um, Tui, but it feels more like a chore than anything else. Like, a little bit. Rusty Bucket Bay is like one of my favorite ones to sort of go to. So you got the trapped um, dolphin. dolphin. Yeah, and actually yeah. that dolphin's in trouble. He's trapped underwater and he can't get to clean water, and obviously he'll die. You know. Um, when you're in like uh, Click Clock Wood in the first game, you need to collect the worms to feed to the eagle. You know, to help him grow and things like that. You're actually directly influencing that character and as much as obviously it's just an NPC it's that interaction that makes it brings it that you know the character a bit more life and memory to yourself good but I haven't felt that interaction into me not in the same way no I mean they have all the characters like you said the polar bears they they uh, come back um, they even make a couple jokes of uh, certain characters like other versions of characters coming back. Uh, the camel's back in Tui as well. Yeah, I know. Um, Gobi. We finally find the fi uh, fire world that he's been looking for. Um, but yeah, I do. I see where you're coming from with that. No character really seems to stick. Um, the only one I can personally say that stuck was uh, Bottles' brother, uh, J uh, Jam Jars, I think his name yeah. is. Uh, I, I really enjoyed his character. His character was a lot of fun to like interact with, but aside from that, I don't think any other character was really memorable. Uh, that's kind of a shame, because uh, with the returning characters, uh, such as Mumbo, uh, they become very... These are characters you liked, and then you start to hate them in this version. You know? Well, yeah. Because Mumbo's useless. And and the fact that you have to control him, like, he, A, he doesn't do a lot anyway, he just needs to get him to a certain place to use his magic and that's it. You literally need to take him from his hut to a plate on the floor to use his magic. Like what's the point? Like it's just it's just irritating. It's a waste of time, it's filler and it just feels like a way of them trying to make the game last longer. A little bit. It does seem like that. But in other respects the game does seem to do uh good things where uh, like Jiggies, uh, there's no animation for like Banjo picking up the Jiggy and uh, Kazooie swallowing it this time around. You just kind of get it. And I felt to me that was just like, okay, I got my Jiggy and I can go. And that was great because it kept kept everything moving. I, I do like the idea that it keeps it moving, but obviously we spoke about this briefly beforehand. And mm -hmm. that actually irritates me as well because... I know that in the first game, like when you're trying to do everything quite quickly, you know, I don't speed run, but like when I play the first game, I know it so well. And I do enjoy it, I love the music, I love the worlds. But obviously, especially when I'm streaming it, I'm just on, you know, I'm just on auto and I can just go through it. And obviously, picking up a jiggy interrupts the flow. But then it does also give you a split second to sort of think, right, this next, this next, you know, then, you know, then do this and do that. And it also gives you. You know, it just gives you a brief break, a brief pause in between each thing you're doing. Whereas I think, and it also it's sort of like a, oh I've done, I've got it, oh great, you know I just did stuff and oh I've I've got a jiggy. Whereas in Tui, you just pick up and you carry on going. There's no sort of 
accomplishment, I suppose. There's no sort of pause to think, oh, now this next door, oh, I've got this place to go. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it. Although it gives you more flow in one respect, I feel for me, it actually kind of diminishes from the game in some way because you haven't got that. A little bit. A little bit. Um. I, there's a lot more backtracking in this game too. I didn't actually have a, too much of an issue with that, except for the fact that you go to a world and there's this, just this one jiggy that you just cannot get. There's no way to get this jiggy. And um, until later on in the game where you get a certain move or unlock something uh, that opens the way to get this jiggy, um, you know, it didn't really bother me. And I guess that's more because I played the game so much as a kid and like, oh, I know how to get this jiggy. I have to come back to it later. Uh, how do you feel about that? Like the backtracking for this game? Backtracking in any game for me is not usually a pretty sight. Um, really, like, I don't expect a game to just be... Um, what's the word? Dull. I'm going dumb now. Um, like, obviously, I don't, I'm, I'm not a big fan of open world games, if you will. But I also don't expect something to just be linear. Yeah. Like, in, cause, like, I'm going to do a lot of comparisons to Kazooie for obvious reasons. It's a sequel, there's always going to be comparisons. Um, yes. In Kazooie there's literally about three jiggies in the whole game that you have to go back for. Um, to, like, you know, to, the, to a previous level at some point. Uh, it's very minor, but it's very obvious when it happens. It's, you know, you can't use the item or the ability to get it. And they even do state at times, oh, we'll have to come back later. Yes. Um, and that's that's quite nice because it does sort of let you know. Whereas in Tui, like you could do a world and only have seven jiggies at the end of it, you know. And it's like because you have to go back with other things to be able to do it, and that's quite frustrating in some ways. Because a, it doesn't tell you, and b, because the, no, the levels are quite big, you're running around aimlessly, wasting time trying to explore to find where things are, but you just can't actually do them. And that also plays into the uh, first-person shooter aspect of that game. Uh, they really shoehorned this game in. I want to say it's because of the popularity of Goldeneye, but I don't know Rare. Well, yeah, well, Goldeneye, I, don't, I think it came after Perfect Dark as well. Probably. So, I, I, I know why they've tried, add, they've tried adding a lot of content, but it also got in the way of other things, in my opinion. Yeah. And there are quite a lot of nice things and charm in, in Tui, and yeah, there's also quite a few things that irritate me. But yeah, definitely, that, that would definitely be one of them. Well, I would say more positive, maybe because I was playing on an emulator, but like the camera was a lot better for me uh, this time around. I played it like I was playing a normal uh, like platformer with camera controls. They did improve really how good. good the auto camera was. I must say, they did improve that. That does feel a lot yeah. smoother. Um, yeah, just just in general, I don't know. It's... Egg shooting. The egg shooting was a lot better with the uh, first person like camera reticle and everything. That did make that did help it quite a lot. Yeah, I felt that was awesome. Um, I felt like uh, with this game, expo like with how big the world were. I felt like they rewarded exploration really well. There was always something to find when you were like, just running around in the world, not even looking for a jiggy. You can either find like a honeycomb or a jinjo. Like, I always felt that was really cool. So you can tell where they hit a technical limitation though with like the size of the worlds. And I know this may sound silly, but like with notes in the first game, they're all singular. You pick up a note, yeah. it's one note. Whereas you even have like treble clefts, which give you 20 notes. That's a fifth of your whole world score. The worlds are so big, you haven't even got notes to find because you find them all within 15 minutes because everything you pick up is five notes straight away. Every time you see a note, there's a basket of five. Yeah. You know, and like, especially in, even in like the very first world, by the time you run up that like hill at the very start of it, you've got nearly all the notes. And you haven't even gone yep, to the I... other rooms yet of the world, like the other areas. Like, that's yeah, one thing that uh... irritates me. Is obviously it's a technical limitation, but then 
why didn't they tone down the world sizes so there was more stuff condensed in the area, but also more stuff to do within it, and that, like, in the first game, if you follow the notes into certain areas, if there's no notes there, you know you've been there. Whereas, in the second game, if there's no notes there, well, you could have been there, but you might not have been, because obviously not everyone's going to remember where they have, have or haven't been, or not easily, because you always forget little areas, everyone does. But, that's the nice thing about the first games, if there's notes there, you know you haven't been there. It kind yeah. of leads you around the world, in a subtle way, but in a, it's sort of, yeah, it's a subtle thing, it's not like, you know, follow the breadcrumbs to get home. You know, it's, it's, it's slight, but it helps. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's another thing that sort of annoys me. I, I'm I'm just gonna rant, like seriously. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I really enjoy the game, but I will say it, it does have its faults. Um, I would definitely think that got me. I hated was the mini games. Every world had a mini game, and every world continuing seemed like it had more and more mini games. The pinnacle was like definitely. Uh, Witchy World. Witchy World, I believe, has like five mini games, Ugh. if not four. Just Witchy World as a world, man, makes me want to cry. It's so boring. I hate the music. The music in that game isn't very memorable to me. That's just me personally. But yeah, wit I just like Witchy it. World itself. Just yeah. Well, I, I can definitely say the mini games in Witchy World were pointless, boring. Well, it was it was weird. It's either pointless and boring, or it becomes incredibly hard just because of the way the game controls. Yeah. Um, one, the one I'm u thinking of right now is the saucer mini game, uh, where you have to shoot the targets. Yeah. It runs you throughout the whole world, and you have to, I believe, get like 300 points or something yeah. to uh, get the jiggy. It doesn't seem hard, and it really isn't in practice, but the way the game controls... And the way the saucer moves and the way the targets are placed, it's nearly impossible. <laughs> like, it's really hard to get those 300 points. It's really easy to get the consolation prize that comes along with that minigame. Yeah. But my god, is that minigame really hard to get the jiggies? Horrible. Because when I was playing through it for this podcast, I was, I was playing the game as much as I could with getting all the jiggies I could uh, with with the exception of the limitations of moves I couldn't get at that moment. Yeah. And Witchy World, I believe, is one of the worlds you can get uh, nearly everything right away. I think there's like one or two jiggies you can't get because you lack a move. Oh yeah, there is, because you can't... You have to, with Banjo, have the sack uh, move where you can pick up the fat kid. Yes. And you can't get that until, like, I, I think after Jolly Rogers. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. It's, it's after I know that. you can, though. Yeah. So, like... The mini games just keep getting worse and worse the more you go into this game. And there's that bumper car one for the jiggy as well. Oh. Like the first the two, bumper the car first one is, two is fine. It's the third one that's annoying as hell, but it's still pretty easy. But it is pretty easy. I didn't have too much of an issue with that mini. Oh, I didn't have an issue. The with saucer that. It one. was just boring as fuck. That saucer one, dude, it was so bad. I remember I tried like three or four times to, just to get the score. Oh. Uh, do that, and as a kid, I remember I had a blast with that mini game. But now it's just, oh god, uh, no. I suppose when we were a kid, like, I suppose like, if I had, if I was given that game growing up, I would have absolutely loved it. I would have soaked it up, and I would have loved it. Like, I'm not obviously saying it's because of modern games or modern game design that has put me off. It's just that even games that are, like following out that had better design than some bits of it do and when you go back and play like banjo kazooie it just sort of highlights the flaws in tui for me and that's just my opinion yeah i mean it's don't get me wrong i actually still do really like banjo tui i have a lot of memories with it it's de i'm definitely looking at this game with like rose tinted glasses i definitely think just i think a lot of games in the n64 generation are a nostalgia thing like, I'm, yes. I, I can I can admit when I like a game because of nostalgia, I, I probably enjoy Banjo Kazooie more than Tui because of nostalgia. You know, they're probably yeah. just as good as each other. But I can admit, like for that generation, like there's people who love Jet Force Gemini. I think it's Never horrible. 
You know, it's it controls badly and just yeah, it's just not great. I never played Jet Force Gemini. No. I remember seeing it like at Toys R Us yeah. when I was a kid. I was like, oh, that game looks cool. Didn't know it was a rare rare game, but yeah. but then you know. that that also reminds you though, like we were saying before, obviously when we were talking about the points for this is the whole fourth wall thing. There's actually oh, yeah. a Jet Force Gemini poster in Bottles House, like when you have to go through there it is. to get to the like worlds. Also, that's another point uh, we were going to talk about. Uh, there's a lot more fourth wall breaking in this game yeah. to the point where I I was cringing at the game and saying, "Let's just move along. You're making a joke. I get it. Let's go. I want to I want to play the game." Like even right near the start, like because for some reason Sui ends up like replying to him saying, "Oh, this is the second game." Yeah, you know, and it's like, what? Just like, why are you doing that? Like, there's no need. No, there's no need. But the game. The game was reveling in itself, or just it was just really enjoying that it was breaking the fourth wall yeah. a lot. Like the first, I mean, like the f- yeah, sorry, mate. The the first no, game like had what's it humor, called? But this uh, something else. Yeah, like like ha- like as soon as Gruntilda's sisters break her out of the rock, they tell her stop rhyming, and I know that's a thing that you really liked in the first game. I, I like just because how stupid it is. Like it's just one of those yeah. character things. Like, you've got this person who's meant to be an evil witch, and yet she's, like, oh, she rhymes, she's like a poet. Yeah. Like, she's evil, and she hates people, she wants to kill you, and destroy all the happiness, and yet she's there rhyming, so technically she's actually quite happy without meaning to be. It's just like, do you know what yeah. I mean? It's it, it's just like one of those things, like, it's, it's a purpose character flaw, which makes the character more interesting and fun. Yeah, and they take that away... Five seconds within the game of Banjo Two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's weird. Like that, um, that. It just changes the character, doesn't it? Pointlessly. Yeah. Though, um, back onto the game itself in the worlds, um, I will. I will give them credit that they made the world very easy to traverse. Like if you needed to go to a certain area, both with like its uh, missile silos that allowed you to go to each hub world in the game. And the actual warp pads. I think they they designed it really well enough to the point where it's like, okay, I need to be here, and it wasn't too much of a chore to get there and to where you needed to go in that area. If you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, they they made the game bigger, but they made it easier to get around to an extent. Yes. But that still, yeah, it still doesn't fix that. I think I th- I personally think that they. I, I agree they needed to make it bigger than Kazooie, but I think they pushed the scale up too much to the point yeah. where there's just not enough in each area, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, like, like I said earlier about the notes, you know, you still only have 10 jiggies on each world, so you can just be running around sometimes just to get from one place from A to B for no reason whatsoever. Um, you know, one thing is like there's not with the worlds personally, like they're a lot bigger, yes, but they there's no depth in them. There's no not a lot of height in a lot of the worlds. Like No. Yes. Well maybe the pterodactyl quite, land. Well that's a bit different obviously. But I think yeah. they try and focus on a different obviously they try and do a different theme with each world. And like like the first half of the game of Tui, really, it's all quite flat. You do have the occasional areas you have to jump up and things like that, there's never any sort of real depth, in my opinion, to the worlds. It's all a lot of running around, and that's really about it. Whereas when you yeah. play Kazooie, the worlds, yeah, they may be a lot smaller, but they're a lot, there's a lot more depth in the world, like actual height, like literally. Um, you know, Treasure Trove Cove is one, one of the best examples, and Clanker's Cabin. Treasure Trove Cove, if you're just running along the ground, you can get from one side of the world to the other fairly quickly, and you can get to most areas, but you can then jump on a flight pad, and there's more to do as you get higher up the world. You know, first you got the walkways, then you got the raised pools, and, and the stairways at the back, you know, and then you go up on top of the whole of the world, and you've got like the lighthouse and stuff, you've got completely separate areas in terms of heights, very easy to separate the world in areas on the ground and in the height as well same yeah. with Clanker's Cavern you've got 
the underwater bit down at the very bottom where you open up uh, Clanker. You've got the ground level and um, like the underwater floor where you've got like notes and things like that. And then you've got the tunnels underwater. Then you've got Clanker himself. Then you've got the platforms around that. And then you've got on top of Clanker. It's it's all very easy to separate the areas, but it's all by height as well as like the actual plane of the world. And I don't get that feeling in Tui. I understand they've made the world bigger and it's to try and bring more exploration with it, but I I don't feel it as being exploration, I feel it more as a chore rather than actually finding something exciting. A little bit. I can see where that definitely comes from. Um I was definitely starting to feel that in uh Jolly Roger Lagoon. That started to hit me really hard. Yeah. Just because of the way the water controls worked in that game and everything. And you literally... It was just like, oh. Yeah. You start the world, you got the pub, and you got like one other house or two. And then yeah. you're literally straight in the water. And even when you go under the water, it's all on... Like, you know, all the entrances to the areas are just on one level, essentially. <laughs> like, it's still not got a lot to it. It seems like yeah. it from one perspective, but it really doesn't. Though one thing I can definitely, another thing, I keep saying one thing, another thing I can definitely um, commemorate uh, Banjo Tui for doing is like they actually did something good with the boss battles this time around. That is true. Um, what's the Mr. Patches, the guy you fight in Witchy World? Yes. Um, that is enjoyable. They, they, you know, they they show you okay, you have this ability that you can shoot eggs and everything. They they the tutorial is sort of that mini game that you play, and then you fight Mr. Patches. And when you fight Mr. Patches, it's a test of your skills with this new skill that you have. And it's the same thing in Jolly Rogers Lagoon when you fight the anglerfish. I don't remember the boss's name exactly, um, but it's, you know, you have a move that you allow, that allows you to shoot underwater and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And it's testing your skills. The, the game did a really good job in boss battles uh, for that respect. Also, another thing I liked was um, for replay value, the way that you found Jinjos was more or less always different. Um, they always randomized Jinjos in the game, so they were all in the same places, but it wasn't necessarily all the same color. Yeah, so you got different. Yeah, you got the Jinjos at different points in the game, depending on what colors you found and when you found them. Yeah, um, like on my playthrough, I found the white Jinjo, and that only has one in that family, so I got an extra Jiggy for my playthrough. Quite early. So it made the game a little bit easier for me, yeah. Yeah, I think I early. got, in, when I was playing, I think I got the white, and I think there's a, blo uh, what other colors are there's only one of? There's two, there's only one of the things, isn't there? No, no, there's, there's one that has two, one color that has two uh, Jinjos uh, in the family, yeah, but that's, that's about it. it. Yeah, that's it, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, I managed to get them but, quite early. Early, so and the white one, so I, I was quite lucky on that. But speaking of the bosses, though, it's nice that actually are bosses. Like yes. that's the thing that so he likes, yeah, because he does kind of have bosses, but it's not seen as a proper encounter. Whereas no, not at all. in Tui, you actually have a proper boss encounter. You know, it's boss music like changes every time, and you've got an actual fight. They are an account of the enemy is always bigger than you, it's a proper it is a proper fight. Do you know what I mean? That's it's what you expect a boss fight to be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do I really do appreciate what they did for Tui, because I remember playing those bosses like Mr. Patches, you even remembered him. Um is like probably the most memorable of all the fights in that game. Yeah. Um and they always like they they like I always say with bosses they test your skills utilizing whatever abilities that you have available, and I always thought like I think that's really great. Um, but you know the game does have its issues. Uh, would you like replay it again, Todd? No, I've struggled to play it so many times, and I still uh, just don't enjoy it. But that's just me well, personally. It's each their own. Yeah. Well, I would say like. Definitely, again, nostalgia here for me. I definitely replay it again for the sake of replaying it. I have very fond memories of playing the game, and I I kind of do want to just play right now again and just finish it just for the sake of it again. <laughs> uh, I I'm tempted to play it, but it only lasts half an hour, and then I just throw it across the room. <laughs> That's fair enough. I know you don't really like it, but um, 
I would say we can end it right here. I'll say that's all we got time for, really. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do for our next episode, but it sh should be really fun. <laughs> it should be. Just keep an it eye on it. <laughs> yep. So this is again uh, Ricardo. And Todd. And we'll see you guys later. Thank you very much.